you to everybody joining. We're going to get started in about a minute or two uh, for our uh, roundtable today and the UN 75 dialogue. I want to welcome all of you uh, on behalf uh, of Globesight and also our uh, fellow discussion leaders um, and our partners. Uh, it's, it's great to have you for uh, this dialogue around championing gender equality amidst the pandemic. Uh, Globesight, uh, for, for those of you, many of you actually know us quite well, uh, we sit at the nexus really around uh, philanthropy uh, and uh, global development. Uh, and we work across the Middle East, South Asia and Africa, um, but really try to elevate a, a number of voices across sectors into the global discussion. Uh, we're really excited to be partnering with the UN uh, United Nations 75 team to enable as many of these conversations in, of course, a virtual environment uh, this year. Uh, what we try to do, whether it's with the UN 75 or in other formats, is to not just have a discussion on the issues where we are just championing what is already going on, but trying to try to challenge the global status quo to see things perhaps a little bit differently so that we can mobilize for impact. And at the end of the day, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to make an impact on, on, on the issues that matter. Uh, so today we have an esteemed panel uh, and an esteemed uh, moderator and an esteemed set uh, of, of, of participants. Hopefully this will be uh, quite interactive and I know that we have uh, people from across a number of countries uh, and you know, from a number of organizations in the private sector, in the philanthropic sector, uh, yeah, with different UN organizations. And I think we're also joined uh, by Natalie Samarising uh, from the UN 75 team. So thank you very much uh, for, for joining us. And, and please do convey our regards to Fabrizio Horschild as well. Uh, I'm gonna turn it over to our chair for today's uh, discussion, Agnes Hier, uh, who's recently joined us as our managing director as we scale our own uh, uh, presence and, uh, and scope and reach uh, and Agnes is helping us navigate that as we help uh, others navigate uh, these very complex spaces. So Agnes, uh, over to you to chair today's uh, session and the discussion. Thank you very much, Tufik. Uh, so once again, thank you very much uh, to all of you for attending this, uh, this very important dialogue. Before diving deep into the discussion, I will share a few words on the agenda for the day uh, and the process that we will be following. So the agenda, we intend to have the first 30 minutes of our discussion today uh, around four guest speakers, whom I'll introduce a little bit later on. And then the 40 minutes remaining will be uh, dedicated to a Q&A and to a, to a discussion between all of us, uh, so we can really craft operable solutions to, uh, to gender equality. In order to make this a process as smooth as possible, we have to follow a few principles. So please uh, bear with us and, and, and be kind and abide. So we will kindly ask you to mute yourselves when you're not speaking, uh, but please keep your camera on so everybody can see everybody. We will ask you to post questions anytime you want in the Zoom chat box at the, at the bottom of the screen. You will see that the chat box is not open. This is intentional. We want us to be focused on the discussion and conversation. And so we, are, we, we made it confidential. As you write your questions, please state your name and organization. Uh, and then after the, uh, the speaker's uh, session, I will call on questions and I will call on you by name. And so you can yourself ask the question to the speakers and the rest of the assembly. So the way we're going to conduct uh, the dialogue is first the question will be directed towards the panel and then anybody in the audience is invited to, uh, to join in. If you want to join in, please raise your hand. So this is also a menu at the bottom of your, your screen in the chat bar in the, in the Zoom menu. Uh, and then we'll call on you to, uh, you know, to add your insights, experience uh, and, and, and opinions. So I will now uh, introduce the topic of the day. So this year in 2020, as you all know, the UN turned 75, and to mark this important anniversary, uh, the UN launched at the end of 2019, the biggest ever global conversation in the world. This initiative aims to hear people's voices on the role of global cooperation in the future and how global cooperation can help build a world uh, that we want, a world more just, with the annual anniversary of the UN in mind in 2045. 
So uh, the idea behind the, convers the conversation is to reach as many people as possible within uh, and across borders, sectors, generations, with an emphasis on the youth, to listen to hopes, fears, ideas, experiences, and to share them with world leaders and senior UN officials at the UN General Assembly at the end of this month uh, of September 2020. Gender equality. Equality between men and women was embedded in the UN Charter in 1945. Yes. 25 years later, women and girls living in a world where gender equality remains unachieved. Uh, and 2020 is an important milestone. Last year was the 40th anniversary of the adoption of the Convention on All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. This year is the 25th anniversary of the Beijing Declaration and Platform for Action, and the 20th anniversary of Security Council Resolution 1325 on Women, Peace, and Security. It's also the fifth anniversary of the adoption of the SDGs, and the 2030 agenda is very clear when it comes to gender equality. Uh, gender equality and the empowerment of all women and girls is a goal by itself. It's SDG number five. And it's also a way, uh, and a, a way of achievement of all the other goals, uh, 17 other goals. Key progress has been made uh, thus far. Uh, we can see uh, progress in terms of equal pay, uh, scores of discriminatory laws have been overturned, but yet the facts today demonstrate that we did not uh, reach gender equality and we're really far from it. It is estimated that more than 2.5 billion women and girls live in countries with at least one discriminatory law on the books. And it is estimated that women and girls put in 12.5 billion hours of unpaid care work each and every day which would represent uh, more than, a, than $10 trillion a year, which is half the, uh, the GDP of the U.S. in 2019. So that was then at, uh, at the beginning of 2020. And then COVID comes and hits the world with health risks, economic burden, needs to arbitrage family and caretaking duties uh, with the demands to make a living, and also fears and uncertainty about the future. Those ways and threats, threats obviously are not specific to women, it's all of us who are affected, and, and the pandemic has, made, has been a proven shock to, uh, to everyone in the world, men and women alike. Yet, again, facts seem to show that women are paying a disproportionate price to the pandemic. Existing trends point to a decreased access to sexual and reprodu reproductive health with longer-term impacts. And there are also evidence of sharp rises in domestic violence in a confinement context. So today together, we aim to contemplate these realities, but we wish to go beyond them. Our goal is really to articulate practical solutions and uh, channel them back to the UN so that from this crisis today, we can imagine how collectively we can use the recovery times to advance gender equality. We will first have our discussion with the four speakers whom I'm, I'm going to introduce right now. I will start with uh, Ambassador Jamal Kokar. Welcome, Ambassador. Uh, Jamal Kokar has been Canada's ambassador to Turkey since November 2019. From 2010 to 2015, he was Canada's ambassador to Brazil. As a senior Canadian official, Jamal was, was responsible for Canada's bilateral engagement in Latin America and the Caribbean, both at Canada's foreign ministry and years later at the Canadian International Development Agency. Other diplomatic assignments, including serving, serving at the Canadian Embassy in Washington, D.C., and earlier in Lagos, Nigeria, and Sao Paulo, Brazil. Outside of government, Jamal was president, president and CEO of the Institute of the Americas at the University of California in San Diego, an institute dedicated to advancing innovation, entrepreneurship, and energy in the Americas. He also served at the Inter-American Development Bank in Washington, D.C. as Chief of Staff to the President, where he supported the bank's renewal and transformation. He also led the creation of the bank's Department of, Department of Outreach and Partnerships, a department dedicated to establishing innovative social impact partnerships for the private sector, NGOs, and private foundations. Jana served as its first executive director. Ambassador Coca was awarded the Queen's Diamond Jubilee Medal for Leadership and Excellence in Strategy Development and Implementation of Canada's Engagement in the Americas. Mr. Coca has studied at Maggie University in Montreal, the University of Ottawa, and the American University in Washington, D.C. In 2002-2003, he was a fellow of Harvard University Wellhead Center for International Affairs. Thank you for being with us today, Ambassador Coca. Thank you very, very much for, for inviting me. And, um, 
And congratulations to, uh, to Globesight, Tofik, uh, Agnes, yourself, Ruala, and, and the rest of the team for putting together this, uh, this very important discussion. As I was preparing last night, I was going through my Twitter account very early and looking at hashtags, uh, gender gap, gender equality, generation equality, and the rest. And I was struck by just how many concurrent conversations there are going on on this very important subject. And that's not to say that somehow this is duplicative. It actually just underscores the fact that this is indeed very important and that uh, there are a number of people engaged in this from a variety of different parts of the world and different types of institutions. So I, I was somewhat surprised that I was asked to speak to this and, and I was trying because I'm not an expert in gender. But what I can bring to this is the policy frameworks that we look at on important issues such as gender. And whether that policy framework is applied through um, national governments or multilateral organizations or indeed through uh, non-for-profits, all of which I've had the opportunity to serve in. The other, I think, uh, not necessarily unique because our audience and our other panelists have worked in or live or are from many other countries um, throughout the globe. And I think what I try to do is bring together those various perspectives. Um, my own background is Pakistani. I was uh, raised in Canada. I did my high schooling in Norway. I'm married to a Brazilian and I've worked in Africa and throughout Latin America. And so each of those offers a perspective. And the perspective I come at this on, on gender is that notwithstanding the geography and notwithstanding culture, there's some common elements, there's some common aspirations, and there are indeed common gaps that need to be met. The other, and we can, I'll come back to that, that point later. The other thing that, that, that I come to this with in, in, in my view is that notwithstanding whether it's a national government, a large multilateral organizations, or indeed um, smaller NGOs, or, or then you're looking at, at subnational governments and municipalities, there are two or three important things. One is that leadership matters. It matters not only in terms of setting the tone and the direction for policy and opening the doors for that and being inclusive and listening, but also for the organizations of where you're trying to bring women into leadership positions. And leadership doesn't always mean being the CEO of the organization. It can being a, be a little bit on, on the, let's say if you're looking at textiles and manufacturing industries. So being the head of the shop floor or getting the middle man out of the way if you're going into buyer relationships. So leadership takes place in different ways. And, and I, I think that's one of the aspirational things that, that, that's very important to look at. So the third point I'd like to talk to and we can bring that is that in terms of innovation and innovation policy, and how you integrate that into rather large and lumbering bureaucracies like national governments or multilaterals at a time when innovation is actually occurring at the speed of thought. How do you actually translate that to make effective policy and programs that reach out and, and have a tangible impact on the communities of interest that we're talking about? So let me just go back a little bit to leadership matters and that governance matters. And I'm lucky enough to come from Canada, where uh, as a matter of national policy, the Prime Minister very clearly states that he's a feminist. And our foreign policy agenda is that the feminist international policy agenda. So that might mean a lot in, in very vague terms for people, but let me, let me drill down a little bit. What does that mean and what, what can be transferable to other governments? One is that at a national budgetary cycle, so the allocation of money throughout the country in terms of national budgets has to go through a gender-based analysis lens. Everything. Every member out of the cabinet on every policy initiative, whether domestic or international, has to go through that lens. And the federal budget has a separate chapter uh, or separate report on gender. And that's a huge demonstration effect because not, does it, not only does that mean that every government department is involved, but on domestic policy, but on international policies that will. And that trickles down. So whether you're talking about large aid flows via the, the international development organizations or the multilateral development banks, or even at my embassy where I give out five to $10,000 or $25,000 small high impact 
development projects, all of those have to be reviewed through gender-based analysis. So what does that mean in terms of what can we do with other countries? Well, just as national governments support countries in their structural reforms on, let's say, anti-corruption or human rights or governance or, or climate, this is an opportunity for national governments to collaborate with other governments, recognizing that their context and the situations are different, and perhaps support them through, accompanying them through the development of national programs and policies that sets the tone at the top, but drills right down through to, um, to um, the, the very basic ground grassroots level. Uh, the other thing that I think that, that matters when I say leadership matters is that demonstrating, for example, in Canada, we have 50% of our cabinet ministers are women. 50%. 50% of our heads of missions or our ambassadors abroad are women. And that's just not tokenism. That's also drawing on this, the, the, the strength and the, the, the perspectives that they come to, to strengthen our policy and strengthen our sort of execution capacity in delivering. On, and I'll, I'll close on this point because I know there's others that want to speak and we can have a more robust conversation, but on innovation and aspirations. Well, one of the things that we know is that, that achieving equality is a very high bar. But most often not, what people are looking for in the most immediate term is the equality of opportunity. So how do we, you know, addressing equality of opportunity that exists at various levels. So whether you're in, in a refugee camp in Syria or in Silicon Valley, what women are looking for, what have, have come to us is looking for equality of opportunity, equality of access, equality of expectations, owning the, the space in which they live and, and live and work, and having the atmosphere of choice. So when you look at macro policies, for example, maternity leave, for example, doesn't necessarily mean that every woman has to have a child. It just means that it gives them an opportunity to have a child without necessarily putting other aspects of their aspirations on hold or be discriminated against. And that kind of analogy can play across the board in, in, in so many different ways. And finally, what I found that's of, of real interest is whether you're talking to uh, textile workers in Haiti or Central America, as I have, or, or women that are involved in startups and innovation and working on FinTech in Silicon Valley, it's the same thing. The aspirations are the same, the barriers are often the same, and it really is about having a dialogue and creating the opportunity for them to remove those roadblocks and let them maximize their own potential, whether it is in, uh, in, in, in the economy or whether it is in, in more of a more social setting. So with that, I will close, and I know there's others to speak and be delighted to have a longer conversation with, uh, with our panelists as well as the audience. Thank you, Agnes. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Kuka. And I think it's, uh, it's very good that you are you the fact that it's, uh, it's uh, aspirations across the board and challenges across the board that, that, that they are the same, sorry. Uh, and Amber, I think I will introduce now uh, Rana Chambaguklu, um, because you can also tell us about uh, what has been the, um, what has been the, uh, the intentionality of, of the group she represents into actually making a change and, and make sure that women are represented also at a higher level. So Rana serves as head of corporate communications and public relations for Cali Group, one of Turkey's biggest industrial conglomerates, active in different sectors and characterized by, by its central focus and commitment in social good. Prior to joining Cali Group, Rana worked as the executive director of the Global Relations Forum. She was a member of the Turkey Euro Foundation Executive Committee and the C20 Steering Committee, and she served as a consultant for various foundations and, and associations. Um, in, in, in Turkey. Earlier in her career, Rana held various positions at the Economic Development Foundation, the European Union Civil Society Development Program, and the EU Research and Documentation Center um, at uh, Bachelier University, sorry for the uh, pronunciation, and the Social Participation and Development Foundation. Rana earned her degree in international relations in 1995 and completed the Euro European Union Master's Program in 2005 at Galatasaray University. 
So thank you, Rana, for, for joining us today. Um, as I was saying, and to just bounce back on what Ambassador Cooper was saying, um, you know, at Kelly Group, you made a, an int intention to, uh, to represent top executives, I mean, women in, into top, top management. So I understand that more than 50% of top executives in the group are women. Uh, and the group is also very intentional about social, uh, social good. Um, and I would like you to, to touch upon these points. How do you manage to have gender equality mainstreamed in your, uh, in your uh, social impact work? And are you playing a role in Turkey as maybe a role model or pushing uh, the rest of uh, the corporate uh, sector in Turkey to, uh, to, to follow your, your, your footprints? Um, thank you, Agnes. It's a, it's a really great honor to be here, even if only virtually with distinguished panelists and audience in peril with the UN's 75th uh, anniversary. Although we are embarrassing it with the, with the major crisis in all aspects of life, I believe it's, a, it's very valuable more than ever to continue dialogue and understand each other. And if I come to your question, I think I was, I was also planning to, to give you a little bit the, 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 the general picture of, of uh, state of play of, of women in, in Turkey. But if I jump directly to, to your question, maybe we can just, you know, um, come back to the in later stages. Um, yes, I am, I am a woman in, in top executive, but I do represent a different, you know, um, uh, kind of uh, the career path, which I was very active in, 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 in women, uh, gender equality issues in civil society and so on. Then I, had the chance to be one of the you know top executive in one of the biggest uh, group of companies in turkey why uh, it doesn't happen in a once but i had a very you know um uh, inspirational and visionary uh, woman ceos and then the president who really believes in uh, not only promoting gender equality but business for social good so, and I think this is also representing an, an, a change of perspective in the sense of the, 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 the promoting or leading the business towards a, um, towards a more sustainable way. And you need, the, you need in that, um, to achieve this, you need few um, expert or different multidisciplinary um, managers to lead the business. So, um, yes, uh, for the last five years, this is a, we are uh, leading the change management, um, but but also um, we, um, but also it it requires you know, all the, a lot of uh, energies, a lot of you know um, communication, a lot of you know uh, um, convincing processes, and so on, so forth. Um, one thing that I, I can um, give uh, such an example, um, we really believe in our, our business in socially responsible business as well as responsible and, and responsible leadership. Um, so this is, this is very important for us to, uh, to, to, to be involved in, um, in gender equality perspective and not only but also. Uh, but um, uh, and to be part of the, the community where business can act together on promoting gender equality. Uh, we are part of the UN, UN Women Empowerment Principle and we keep records our performance on women employment and uh, women's participation in company decision maker, making processes. Despite operating in a male dominated industry. And as, I, as you mentioned, as you underlined, that we are proud to reach 50% of, of women in top management. But if I come back, what we exactly do, this is yes, this is in business, but what we really give to our society in terms of promoting women, in terms of um, uh, uh, the, 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 uh, promoting our vision, um, I, ha I want to emphasize uh, on social innovation and social innovators. Um, there are also social innovators, and since we are also, you know, talking about the effect of COVID-19 and so on, 
um, we recently witnessed many social innovators who hack gender equality regardless of what um, COVID-19 brings. Um, we've been conducting for the last four years our social entrepreneurship program uh, and there are a lot of promising facts and information regarding reaching and, and fighting against you know, uh, inequalities or, uh, you know, on that issue. Um, we, we have a social entrepreneurship uh, award program and this year the number of female applicants exceeded that of male and 40, 54 sorry, of applicants were women who set to change the world as we know it. That, that was very clear. And while I was conducting one of one uh, interviews with the applicants, we listened to some very inspiring women who dedicated themselves to change the rules of the games in male dominant sectors such as seafarers. Or yet again, they established support systems to enable their sister to have access to education, employment, and so, so forth. Or also they found innovative ways to empower them through well-designed mentoring mechanisms and viable business plan, uh, which I cannot say the name of the candidates who, who might be the one of our you know, winner in that you know, forthcoming award uh, program, or came up with the interesting models to bring art or as therapy, or devise new ways of, to enroll more girls in STEM. That's very promising and that really, really, really um, uh, um, gives us uh, um, the, the, the excitement that we are in the, in the right way to do so. Upon hearing this, maybe I would, uh, maybe, maybe we can come back to this, uh, to this uh, success, uh, key success uh, experience that you're, you're stating. I think it'd be nice to, uh, to dig in them. Um, but I, I would like to, to, uh, to take the opportunity to also uh, you know, introduce Hannah School and Russian Paul. And so we can really actually, uh, you know, uh, dig into the social innovations as uh, lessons that we can scale maybe to, uh, to advance gender equality as we uh, recover from, uh, from COVID-19. Thank you so much. Um, so, Ranesh, Roshan, I, I will introduce uh, both of you uh, one after the other, if you, if you don't mind. And so, we can then really focus on, on, on the discussion between, uh, between, uh, between you four and, and, and open to the rest of the assembly. Um, I will start with, uh, with Rana, um, Women's Fast. Not, not sure it's gender equality or not. Uh, but anyway, so Rana who is the Chief Executive Officer for the Humanity Foundation, where she drives the foundation's mission of accelerating gender equality through innovative investments. Before joining Humanity in 2018, Rana headed Changing Pink, an organization she founded in 2012, and through which uh, she partnered with public, private, and non-governmental institutions to provide advisory, consulting, and capacity development services to eliminate gender inequalities between men and women in the MENA region. Earlier in her career, Rana joined McKinsey and & Company and established a board director institute for the GCC region, managing key relationships and leading the design and manage management of the institute's objectives and activities. She then served as Organization Development Director for General Electric and led the company's regional gender balance agenda. She was the youngest member of the organization promoted to the executive leadership team in MENA, a position that allowed her to be a key partner to G's most senior leaders on various strategic initiatives. Rana started her career with Dubai government, where she led the design and development of the authority's leadership program for government employees. As a relentless advocate for social justice and narrowing the inequality gap, Rana is a published writer, expert speaker, and key contributor to international newspapers and publications. She holds an MPA from the University of Liverpool in the UK and a BBA from the University of New Brunswick in Canada. Uh, Rana, thank you for joining us today. Uh, and I will uh, ask you some questions right after introducing Roshan. Roshan Paul has, left, has spent his life questioning the status quo and built a career around connecting global citizens to solve social problems across boundaries. After working in Ashoka for a decade, he co-founded Amani Institute in 2011 with these values in mind. Today, Amani Institute operates in Latin America, Africa, and India, and has trained more than 10,000 people around the world towards careers in social impact. Raised in Bangalore, India, Roshan has a Master in Public Policy from the Harvard Kennedy School and a Bachelor's in International Political Economy from Davidson College. He has guest lectured at over 50 universities and other institutions around the world, including Harvard, Georgetown, and the World Bank. He served a term on the World Economic Forum Global Future Council on Behavioral Science, 
was awarded the Leadership in Education Award by the World Education Congress and was named one of the Asia, Asia Society's Asia 21 Young Leaders in 2018. Roshan has delivered several TEDx talks. His writing has been published in Forbes, a Stanford, Stanford Social Innovation Review, MIT's Innovation Journal, India Today, and the India Development Review. He has been interviewed in the Huffington Post, Vanity Fair, and Forbes, as well as several podcasts. Roshan is also the author of two books, Search a Lot of World, a novel, and You Were Begins at No, a collection of essays on social impact education. He is currently writing a book on social impact careers in the 21st century. So, uh, Rana, Rana School, um, you have undertaken extensive work towards bridging the gap between men and women over the past 15 years, uh, and in all sectors, really. Today, in the scope of your work at Humanity, you're supporting many programs intended at uh, um, advancing, advancing uh, women's situation, supporting women entrepreneurs, uh, fighting gender-based violence. I would like to ask you, um, over the past uh, year, how have you noticed that uh, COVID-19 has affected women? I mean, can you, can you really see the impact on the ground and what type of areas have been pushed back the most? Uh, and how do you address it? Are you addressing it in, in the programs you're, uh, you're undertaking uh, on the ground? Thank you so much. Uh, pleasure to be here. Um, and thank you to the GlobeSight team for convening this uh, exciting discussion. Um, so how has COVID in the last year affected women? And I guess more so from um, our perspective as being on the ground, like you mentioned, with various different, you know, covering many different areas. So we've all heard, you know, the global talk around how COVID is um, affecting, you know, women at a much larger scale. And although the fatalities are higher, the fatality rate is higher in men, um, the socioeconomic impacts actually uh, are particularly severe for, um, you know, women specifically. We all know that uh, women are at the core or at the forefront of being um, healthcare um, or, or health at the at forefront of the health emergency response. Uh, and at social services response, exposing them obviously to high rates of infection. Um, we know, um, and as you mentioned, um, how the, the burden of uh, you know care work, whether it's uh, care for you know children or for the elderly, falls primarily um, on you know a woman's shoulders. But to put it into perspective, the rates are huge globally. Women assume seventy-five percent of um, child care and elderly care in regions that are more skewed towards it like in mina the rate jumps to 80 90 percent um when we talk about um other effects of COVID, it goes way beyond that when we talk about uh, about 110 million girls in mina unable to access school during lockdown uh, it's a huge number but it's not only about the number uh, when we also talk about uh, you know, the digital divide uh, and how less uh, girls have access to digital, um, uh, you know, any, any, any form of digital access. We're also looking at not girls sitting, uh, you know, at home during lockdown and not being at school, but also their ability to access um, online uh, learning is also hindered more so than uh, boys. So we know for a fact in MENA that uh, internet penetration rates for uh, women-led households are um, about a 10 percentage point lower than men, um, you know, kind of men-led households. So, it, you know, the, the problems are real. To compound it even more, um, the teaching profession as well, uh, you know, globally, but more so as well in regions such as MENA, are mostly female-led. Uh, so we know that in these occupations, there are issues of whether um, you know, women teachers are also doing the uh, unpaid care work at home and also trying to adjust to a new learning environment to deliver uh, digital learning to uh, students. So the problem gets just, you know, kind of compounded. You mentioned very quickly um, when healthcare sector is overwhelmed, um, then we have an impact and an effect on maternal and um, contraceptive services for women. So we are talking about in more gender, you know, kind of uh, vulnerable regions or where, where the gender indicators already uh, are struggling. You're talking about teen pregnancies. You're talking about, uh, you know, an increase in maternal death rates. Uh, you're talking about um, also the effects that we see of how women making up more um, of the informal uh, work sector, where they are more exposed to, um, uh, 
uh, you know, they, they don't have a social safety net, social, you know, they don't have a, a kind of a, a basic net that they can fall back into uh, in terms of, um, you know, losing their jobs uh, and what happens after that. But, you know, so, so it is heavily competitive. We know as well that although the global unemployment rate, women make up some 39% um, of, of global employment, uh, so when we talk globally, women make up 39% of global employment, but they account for 54% of the job losses during COVID. Uh, so these numbers really put into perspective when we say that women are uh, hit harder during the pandemic. Um, and when we talk about issues of gender equality, I think a lot of these uh, numbers and kind of the regional disparities so that can really put it into context that where we see gender indicators lagging behind, we're seeing a translation of um, the COVID impact on women at a, at a, you know, kind of a much larger, at a much harder rate. And I kind of will stop here because I'm not sure how much, uh, you know, how long I should or shouldn't take. Uh, I'll be happy to also address kind of uh, and go a little bit deeper, but I guess a bit later into the discussion of some of the real kind of, um, you know, experiences that from running our programs uh, and how these could act as um, really kind of thinking through the interventions in the future of how we would be able to counter uh, effect and, and not kind of regress to uh, on, the, on the very kind of, in my opinion, small gains that we made when it came to uh, gender equality over the last few years. Yeah, thanks so much, Rana. Yeah, we, we really intend to, uh, to look at best practices that it can actually help us. Uh, yeah, not, not, not going the same, same, uh, same, same pitfalls, basically. Roshan, um, you know, at Amani, uh, with the Amani Institute, you're also conducting um, programs intended at women, uh, whether it be in education or leadership, uh, leadership uh, realm. I would like to ask you how you manage to mainstream uh, gender equality in these programs. Is it like a standalone goal? Um, you know, how are you intentional about it and how do you make it a success? Right. Uh, thanks, Agnes, and thanks to Globeside as well for the invitation to speak on this uh, panel and such an important topic uh, as well. Uh, like Ambassador Kokar, I'm no expert on gender equality, um, but as a topic, but, I, but we do a lot of work on it indirectly, I think, particularly around focusing on uh, leadership roles uh, played by women in organizations around the world. Um, you know, for instance, that one of our core pieces of work is around um, helping people build uh, careers in social impact. Um, you know, we run a fellowship program that uh, helps people to switch from the private sector to the social sector or to, um, you know, to expand to, um, uh, to get promotions in the social sector. And we've worked with, you know, more than 540 people now from 65 countries, of which 72% um, are women. 80% uh, 80 80 from the global south. So um, I think that's been something that, you know, we've, I think almost like haven't had to do specific gender mainstreaming of it because it's already kind of built in um, by, by virtue of the, the, the program being so dominated um, by uh, female participation. And, um, and also with our organization, um, you know, you've heard all of the, I'm sure everyone knows, you know, the social sector, for instance, is dominated by women in general, but more men are in leadership roles um, in the sector. And, and for us, I'm the only man on our seven person leadership team. Um, you know, all the others are women and 85 percent of our organization um, is, is also women. Um, we do a lot of work with organizations around the world, um, and I can share some examples uh, of that later as well, around um, you know, different topics. We've, uh, we've worked with more than 100 organizations uh, in five continents in a consulting or capacity, internal capacity building um, way. Uh, some of those projects have had to do with, uh, with gender equality, um, and I'm happy to talk about uh, some of those uh, as well. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Roshan. Uh, before we, uh, we ask a few more questions to our four guest uh, speakers, I would like to, uh, to remind the rest of the audience that you can post your uh, questions uh, in the chat room or your comments, or if you want us to, uh, you know, to, uh, to, uh, to dive into specific subjects, health, education, please do so, uh, so we can, uh, we can go to these uh, points after uh, talking with our, our guest speakers. 
So you all spoke about, um, you know, leadership, social innovations, uh, how can we make, uh, can we draw lessons from what, we, uh, what we've seen and what we've learned over the, uh, the, the COVID-19 um, period. Um, I would like uh, Rana as school, you know, you, you offered to, uh, to provide uh, some uh, thoughts around it. So please, um, I, I would like you to, uh, to, to do so and uh, to be as practical as, as possible. Um, you know, one thing, for instance, for me, education, you know, of course, uh, we were all pushed into a virtual education, distance education. Can that actually help, uh, you know, have more women educated uh, in the future because then we will reduce the need for them to actually go somewhere? Great, yeah, thank you. That, that kind of, I'll, I'll segue from, from talking about that, which is true. I'll give you an example actually from one of our programs, Girls Can Code, which is our program in Afghanistan that primarily teaches girls uh, between grades 10 and 12, uh, English language skills, computer literacy, and coding skills. Uh, and that is part of what we do to try and create pathways of employment for Afghani girls in, in STEM careers. Um, and as soon as COVID hit, uh, we were able to switch to online, um, you know, to kind of an online uh, mode. So that's, that's the first step. But when I dig further into the question um, or into that, you know, kind of phenomenon of online learning, um, that could specifically in, a, in, in the context of Afghanistan where it is uh, less safe for girls to be out on the street and, and be in schools specifically. Um, but if we actually kind of dig deeper, we will, and, and you'll see from our own experience that we were only able to provide the online learning to girls who had access to computers and to internet connections. Uh, so we, when we talk about impact of COVID and what can we use from this crisis for the future, uh, the first thing that comes to my mind is um, the necessity of interventions that address both digital uh, and infrastructural kind of inclusion. Um, and that is extremely specific. And I'll, and I'll give you the good, it's kind of like the, the winning stories. So we support a lot of partners on the ground in, uh, in India and in Brazil uh, and the Global South when it comes to our program on the prevention of violence against women. What we have noticed is that the organizations that have were already and our partners on the ground that were already set up um, to include their local communities of, of women um, digitally uh, were super more resilient in responding to this crisis. And I'll give you two very quick examples. We work uh, through our Prevention of Violence Against Women program, uh, sorry, the Prevention of Violence Against Women and Girls program, which is Womanity Award. We work with two partners, Safety Pin from India and Soul City from South Africa. Uh, Safety Pin already had uh, an app um, that was free and accessible that maps uh, a particular city on measures of safety. Uh, so users, women users are able to go into the app and, and check which areas in the city, what's the safety measures, is it a safe area? It helps them navigate the city, it helps them, it helps them stay safe. And, and as soon as COVID hit, Safety Pin was able to add in tons of necessary resources and information, helplines, uh, how do you access, um, you know, resources if you're caught in a domestic violence situation? Because we knew that COVID meant um, that a lot of the resources that were available to women um, survivors of violence are no longer there. Uh, so the, the capacity of Safety Pin to, to have had that already as part and parcel of the programs that they provide made them more resilient to be able to face the crisis. Same thing happened with Soul City. Soul City had an app that actually helped um, through storytelling, uh, so it, it helped you know survivors uh, go into these apps and, and be able to tap into resources that could help them emotionally, that could help them uh, you know uh, physically figure out where what, what resources to tap into. They experienced 110 percent surge uh, in their app use, 60 percent surge in uh, new user registration in April of 2020. Um, and so you see how you know digital inclusion and and for our you know from our experience partners that have had digital inclusion on their agenda before covid became more resilient during these times and and were able to provide more resilience to their local communities um and and that's for me um you know one of the main uh kind of focus areas of what we need to do now because we're, we can't wait until covid is done what we need to do now, what we have needed to do before, 
uh, and it's already things that are there. We already know that interventions to address digital uh, inclusion are important. Interventions to address financial inclusion uh, are important. Marrying the two together, so interventions that address digital financial inclusion are important, and that's where we need to invest money, time, and effort in. And we have seen it firsthand of how this all transpired in COVID to create more resilient partners on the ground, but also more resilient um, you know, communities uh, that are able to kind of uh, face this crisis and are able to push back. And, and that kind of would be my um, bit of highlights of our experience there. I think it's very interesting, uh, you know, you, you stated yeah, the infra infrastructural uh, component and basically what you're, you're, you're conveying that community-based uh, solutions work because they work best for the women in the community. Obviously, we know the needs, we know, you know, you know what, to, what to develop for them. And then, um, you know, it, it would mean that the international community would be expected to actually provide the infrastructure, right? So focus on, on, on infrastructure as opposed to, uh, to content. Um, and Ambassador Koka, I would like to ask you to, uh, you know, to, uh, to jump on that, please, and to, uh, to tell you how you see international cooperation uh, helping uh, gender equality on those uh, aspects of, um, you know, content programs opposed to systems infrastructure. How can partnership be built? Uh, what sort of, uh, of solutions uh, can be made to actually make the solutions scalable, replicable, and accessible to, uh, to more women? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much for that. And I was intrigued and, and interested very much in the, in the examples you brought up on, on Afghanistan and what else is going on. So this is like, this is a perennial question, right? It's, it's, a, it's often about extraordinary ideas coming from small organizations that need to, to go to scale, right? So as, as you said, replicable, transferable, and then going to scale. And, and oftentimes, I'm just going to be blown, governments aren't necessarily the best way to get into that, right? Um, you know, when you're running a development assistance program for at a national level, it's recipient country driven. Right, so there, there it's, the, it's the country that, sell, that sends to us the, the guidelines. These are the types of programs and activities we'd like to do and negotiate it out and there's projects. But the, the ability to be agile and nimble for smaller types of programs is not as, for the big bilateral programs, not as, 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 as open. There are channels, each country has them, there where they in fact um, solicit and they call in um, um, individual proposals from countries and oftentimes that's through the embassies or through um, through, uh, through through headquarters I found actually that it's 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 through multilaterals where um, and I can speak for the Inter-American Development Bank and I'm sure the Asian Development Bank and other development banks have the same thing is that um, um, I have to have created the window in the Inter-American Development Bank that that leverages um, uh, private sector, private philanthropy, uh, donations from those groups and align them with these types of projects on larger development projects. So you can, there's a channel for, for monies through, through that. Um, and I found that, that if you can kind of get in through those systems, that's far, that's far more, um, it's far quicker to get it because the decision tracks are a little bit, uh, a little bit easier. And finally, you know, I, uh, I've, I've come in and out of government three or four times, and I'm always impressed by the, the, the vibrance of the private sector and private philanthropy in supporting these types of activities. And it's really by identifying the, the groups and the stakeholders that have a particular interest either in the country or in the technology, right? It's usually, it's somewhere in between the two, the country, the issue of the technology, and, and it takes some searching around. But it's almost glib to say that oftentimes it's not a shortage of money, it's the identification of the sources of money and the identification of good projects because everybody's looking for, as you said, uh, projects that have scale and that have impact. And oftentimes um, non-bilateral uh, non or non-multilateral sources of income uh, or, or, or donations is far more effective. And just to close on this point, when I was setting up that, uh, that organization in, within the IDB, we found that uh, private sector money, so that can be high net worth individuals, private philanthropy, corporate uh, foundations, family foundations, and others, 
outstripped by far, by far, uh, official development assistance by governments. And so it's, it's really a matter of, of, of the guideposts of how, how is it that you identify. And I think that's something that perhaps Globesite and other partners with Globesite can think about doing, you know, doing the matchmaking work that allows for really good projects like Rana is talking about to find a home and, and, uh, and a sponsor. Yeah, that's very, it's very, uh, yeah, it's very enlightening. Also, on the on the role that private sector, as you say, and private philanthropies have to play. Um, so, Rana Birden, uh, I would like to uh, to you to react on that to the role of private sector. I mean, you are at Cali Group really intentional about playing a role in social good. Um, how specifically uh, on gender equality do you think you can actually make the right choices? Um, what are your uh, takes with the you know with the with the communities uh, on the ground? Um, and how are you uh, conducting this work? I mean, by yourself, or what are your connections with other organizations in Turkey? Maybe the government? How are you? Uh, how are you uh, conducting it? Okay. Um, let me first begin that the gender equality has been an, an unfinished business in every corner of the world, and and this remains for true for the new new world order, new normal. Uh, but it doesn't mean that we have to stop fighting and as a, you know, as a responsible private sector as well. Um, as the saying goes, and um, when there's a will, there's always a way, as Mr. Ambassador has you know, uh, underlined, the cooperation matters a lot. So we have to find a way no matter how it's done and how many years it takes. So th this, is, this, is, this is how we see the, the to, to promoting gender equality in in the country as well as in our um, ecosystem. Uh, during the first round of, uh, of discussion, I was a little bit you know, uh, trying to describe our you know, social uh, innovation. And um, I do think that one of the way uh, to, to promote gender equality and also to, to, to by, while witnessing the, the forthcoming young generation, um, we do see that maybe social entrepreneurship might be a new window for opportunity for women to fulfill their potential and bring to life the successful social businesses with their inherently strong qualities of persistence, optimism, and diligence, which are most sought for trade and social entrepreneurs. I think there's a great um, opportunities in the sense of to, in the sense of where private sector, I mean the biggest corporate uh, co companies, uh, can rely on it, can invest on it. Uh, this this area, I think, also present itself a catalyst for change uh, among young women and to find their own voice and the inner strength in a patriarchal world as my country and they help others find their, theirs. Um, so as Kali Group, we advocate responsible and responsive leadership. Uh, that means enables people from all walks of life to be agent of change and to create impact in their own domain. Uh, maybe if I just add one of the other examples how we promote this is that the, one of the other focus area that we work in it is the woman ceramic artist. Uh, who pioneer not only in their own field, but also are also recognized nationally and um, internationally. Um, uh, for instance, one of the, uh, 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 and, and we are trying to brought life the most comprehensive exhibition of the, one of the most first woman uh, ceramic artists, Turkey's first ceramic artist as an inspiring model for younger generation to come and starting a funding for ceramic students. So this is how we trying to open the doors with our um, uh, social project where we, uh, where we present and where we give floors to young women. Maybe we can just follow on on that topics later on. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, Roshan, last question for you uh, before opening the floor to our, to our participants. Um, so with the, uh, the, the program, pro programs we're undertaking, sorry, at Amani, 
Um, how are you uh, working with other partners in the uh, aid uh, on international development wheel to try and you know use them as best practices, uh, you know, uh, pilot projects to actually uh, you know scale them uh, and make them uh, accessible to more people? And what are you standing away from from the the more institutional uh, development development uh, realm? Yeah, thanks, uh, Anias. Um, I think, uh, you know, just to, to share a couple of examples. Uh, firstly, we are currently having a partnership with the US Embassy in India. And this picks up actually some of what Rana was saying about uh, social entrepreneurships. Um, we are working with, um, an, or we are creating, in fact, a network of 40 uh, women social entrepreneurs uh, called the Indian Women Social Entrepreneurship Network. Um, and it's, uh, it's a program in partnership with the US Embassy in India, as well as with the Aspen Network for Development Entrepreneurs. Um, and this is a program in which we are working with um, 40, you know, women-led social enterprises um, to help them to figure out how are they not only going to survive the pandemic's impact on their work, on their businesses, um, um, on the impact that they can have, um, but also thrive beyond, right? So um, we're dealing with some of those, you know, general important things like fundraising and business models and storytelling, um, but we're also working on questions of personal leadership leadership in this time, you know, the inner journeys uh, specific to women uh, leaders and women-led enterprises, um, questions of mental health and well-being, uh, you know, as you lead an enterprise in these difficult times uh, as well, you know, and we are finding that the group is really coming together, um, they're bonding, they're learning a lot from each other um, and sharing with each other how they're working, you know, um, to, uh, to continue to have an impact and to make sure their uh, enterprises to thrive, um, you know, despite this, this difficult time. So that's, that's one example. Um, I think another example that we're, you know, uh, working with uh, the British Council in Brazil um, on a program to, um, you know, particularly around women scientists. Again, you know, women are relatively underrepresented in the science field. Um, and so it's not only important to work, um, you know, uh, with them around their careers as scientists, but also like playing a leadership role um, as a women scientist, right? Uh, leadership in the field of science while being a woman. And so uh, in addition to leadership development and so on, we're also doing peer-to-peer -peer mentorship uh, so that they can, you know, support each other. Um, uh, you know, but also in what, what is really exciting is like that, how can they mentor the next generation of women scientists? So, you know, girls coming up to want to be scientists in Brazil. Um, and how can these women scientists that are already established mentor the next generation of, um, of women scientists as well? Um, so those are a couple of examples. Um, you know, and I, again, I've got a couple more, but, uh, but I know you, um, you want to move on to the, uh, the Q&A, so, so I can come back to that at the end. Yeah, thank you so much. Yes, we're mindful of, of uh, you know, integrating all of us in discussion, and uh, thank you, Roshan, for, for, for that. Um, so uh, we have received a few questions in our chat. Um, I would like to ask uh, Sadia Hamdani, Director Gender Equality Plan International Canada, to um, you know to come and and and, uh, and make her, her statement and ask the question. Thank you. Well, thank you ever so much, and uh, it has been most interesting and inspiring, really, to hear every one of the speakers. As an organization, uh, which is, as you may know, an international not-for-profit that has about 85 years of experience of working in more than 80 countries around the world, committed to what we call affecting or supporting gender transformative change towards the realization of the rights of children, particularly girls, and of course, gender equality is our foundational um, work. You know, it strikes me uh, and I'm, as I'm listening, whether it's to Ambassador Coker or Ran, both the Ranas as well as Roshan, um, we as a global community um, tend to address gender inequality within silos and kind of, yeah, we can do this, in, uh, policy change, institutional strengthening, empower the woman, because all this, I would say, is lower hanging fruit. Extremely critical. There's no doubt about it. 
But then we also know inequality starts from sometimes pre-birth and then from your home into your society, into institutions and policies. How, from each one of your perspectives, and I can of course cite uh, millions of examples from our work, but how do you work with the real gender inequality barriers that Ambassador Coker referred to initially, which is patriarchal structures, um, the fact that women have very little decision-making power in their lives, and even if they are earning equal incomes, et cetera, what's the control over that? So, you know, how do you work with that social ginormous piece at the back which is still there, even if women are leaders, even if women are are earning equal pay for work of equal value, which we know hasn't happened in the world yet. So it would be very interesting, particularly from the social finance and the social impact uh, investments points of view, because that is something we are also digging deeply into. Thanks. Thank you so much, Sadia. Um, so I'll turn to four panelists. If uh, any, I mean, any one of you wants to uh, wants to tackle this uh, this question, Rana, I saw that you uh, Rana asked so that you unmuted yourself. So, so <laughs> <I take it. laughs> uh, but yeah, thank you for asking that question. You know, I actually had a couple more. You know, so so I kind of had three things that I really wanted or would have loved to kind of bring out. Um, from our own experience as humanity, but also from kind of my own kind of like where I am passionate about, you know, more personally and more specifically, which ties in very well with what humanity does, which is fantastic and perfect. But anyways, uh, but one of the things that I wanted to mention is that, we, and, and I spoke about interventions to kind of address digital and financial inclusion. I know that you touched on a social entrepreneurship and I'll, I'll kind of get to that as well from humanity's context. But um, a, a big part of what we do at Womanity um, revolves around attitudinal change. Um, and that was my third point. My third point was this intervention to, ad to address these attitudinal shifts and to shift gender power dynamics. Um, because we know that when we talk about women's issues, there that there is extreme interdependency. Uh, and it's not just women's issues. It's, it's, um, it's a societal issue. It's, it's the patriarchy. It's the systems that have been in place, like you said, uh, that probably affect us pre-birth. Yes, I agree 100%. Um, and for us, we, at, you know, particularly at Womanity, we've been kind of doing media for, um, media for change and media for smashing gender stereotypes and media for shifting gender power dynamics for the last 10 years in MENA. Um, and where I actually see um, the real dilemma is that, you know, we're doing it. Uh, there are a few others that are doing it it is nowhere near enough. Uh, because when we talk, and, and I'm kind of gonna address it from a content perspective, and, and we know the data. So 96%, 96% of content worldwide, and that's content that you consume, it could be an image, it could be an opinion editorial, it could be a news uh, kind of reporting, so whatever. So 96% of content that is out there in the entire world reinforces gender stereotypes that leaves 4% that is either neutral or that is combating this, you know, you know, great, you know, kind of, uh, you know, pushback on this. So, so we're, we're doing nowhere near enough to really kind of question what it, wh where the roots of this, where does it all come from? Uh, because no matter, and, and I agree with you, we're doing a lot of things in silos and they're, ex they're still extremely important. And even when we do it in collaboration, um, that's just pockets and pieces of it. But if we don't actually come down to the roots uh, of where this all comes from, um, where, where does this all really emanate from, then we're, we're, we're not going to make much progress. But there's, there's that aspect of things. And there is uh, some of, some, one of the things that we've been also thinking about is we keep coming up against the wall uh, almost whenever we talk about the patriarchy, whenever, whenever we talk about shifting these deeply entrenched um, you know, stereotypes and, uh, you know, as a small foundation, we are, we are thinking about, well, how can we, how can we really change the narrative? Because there's just so much um, pushback, so much uh, controversy. We, we, we say women's rights are human rights. It doesn't stick. It doesn't work. We say the patriarchy is harmful for both women and, and men. It doesn't stick. It doesn't work. Um, and, and so there is this collective need for us to really almost 
uh, you know, find a new space, find a new space where we, where this can actually stick. And I'll, I'll reference sort of a, um, you know, one of the examples that we know from looking into this is that really the moment that, um, you know, the, the entire movement, the LGBTQ movement kind of moved on the topic of gay marriage in the U.S. was when we started hearing about love is love. And so all the previous talk about the same things that it is, you know, kind of human rights, it's a, it, it didn't stick. But when we spoke about love as love, it kind of made this huge progress. And I'm thinking, we are thinking, right, of how can we make that leap? Uh, how can we actually make that leap so that we are really are kind of having this narrative that does truly stick um, and, and that kind of galvanizes this, this, this change around these deeply in, entrenched attitudes that if we don't start shaking them and moving them from their roots, we're gonna continuously be in this cycle of um, you know, going back and forth into it. So I think interventions you know, in attitude, to address these attitudes are really important. Uh, and I think I'll add one kind of quick point on social entrepreneurship, and that was kind of just a, um, a little bit of uh, you know, a segue into it. We, know, we also know that um, COVID is, has presented kind of, COVID has made us look, you know, kind of see what works and what doesn't work. Uh, because whoever had it before COVID is, is doing okay in the crisis and, and they're still um, kind of continuing, they're not doing great, but their interventions are still working and are, are still, you know, reaping results. And those that haven't been doing it are really struggling. And, and we know that supporting uh, women SMEs, um, supporting women local collectives, um, having these local communities of empowered women leaders that basically know their communities really well, uh, are so embedded in their communities, um, have actually, you know, presented opportunities. In, for, for, in a case of one of our social entrepreneurs that we support, one of our kind of partners in, in India, Frontier Markets, uh, who provide um, uh, product and services to the last mile in India through a network of rural women entrepreneurs that they have created. Uh, they were one of the first organizations that got permits by the Indian government to go in there because they were there. They could actually get um, basic food supplies. They were the quickest ones um, you know, on, uh, on the field. And so how can we actually, and, and we know for a fact now that actually communities with uh, you know, collectives, with women collectives and self-help groups are more resilient. They've responded to the crisis in a more resilient way. And how can we start really thinking about kind of these pockets from attitudinal shifts to uh, you know local collectives of, of women leaders? And how can we how 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 do we use this opportunity to actually realize that these are um, are a kind of our only hope to kind of push uh, and not regress. Uh, from from where we've started on on um, you know gender equality because of COVID, and regard. If you allow me, just to interject exactly, Rana, and I think one of the hallmarks of the Canadian uh, ODA this time, and we are super proud of it, frankly speaking, is the focus on the on the empowerment, support to, and and sustainability of local women's rights organizations. They are the drivers of change, let's, let's face it. And they have been the most marginalized across the board, whether whatever sectoral health, education, economic empowerment, what have you, they have been marginalized, right? And I think this growing recognition that they are the actual drivers and engines of change, we're seeing that a lot of traction is happening, but it's just not enough. And collectively, I feel like that is an area where if we all come together, you know, they move mountains, like you rightly say. They do. Thanks. I'll, I'll keep quiet now. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Salia and, and Rana. Um, we had another question, uh, also touching about uh, gender power uh, dynamics. Uh, Nihal, uh, from ahead of the curve, uh, I, would, uh, I would be uh, grateful if you could ask your question. Sure, and I'm following up, I mean, from the discussion that just happened now between Sadia and, uh, and Rana, because I'm an anthropologist uh, anyway, and I work with the head of the, uh, head of the curve as a social business based in Cairo, Egypt. Uh, and we've been dedicated to diversity and inclusion, uh, sustainable management practice and inclusive market growth. We do a lot of work at the policy level. 
um, to promote gender equity in the private sector. A lot of our work is with the private sector at different levels. We've done a lot of work with the National Council of Women as well. So what we've come across in our work is that you can have good policies and you can have good legislation and this doesn't filter down. And we've done research on unconscious gender bias, but in our part of the world, it's not unconscious. It's actually quite open, declared gender bias. I mean, I want to um, call back to something Rana said, where we've, in our part of the world, we've made some very small uh, advances, but we tend to take one step forward and then two steps back. I mean, particularly in the context of what's happening in Egypt now, I mean, Sadia was saying, yes, women's rights organizations, they are the drivers uh, of, of change, but our NGO sector here, um, especially for NGOs working in the area of human rights, uh, they are extremely, extremely constrained. So they're not going to be the drivers here in Egypt, unfortunately. And, and I don't want to get into too many details, but for me, this idea of how do we work on changing the cultural belief systems that underlie at all levels the lack of gender equity, uh, not only in the home, but in, in the public space, in the labor force, et cetera. I mean, how is something, how can we capitalize on this issue of COVID that's happening now um, to, to try and make a change? Because I think the research has demonstrated that for, in Egypt, at least, the, the views of Egypt's youth um, regarding gender equality are just as, they're more aggressive than that of the grandparents' generation number one. And number two, they're shared by men and women. Um, this is a huge obstacle. So I, I just want any insights. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you, Nihal. I think on this front, Ambassador Kuka, you probably can, uh, can help us uh, you find maybe not a solution or, 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 an, or an answer, but through the example of Canada, obviously, but also all the countries you've, you've served in, uh, what do you think are the, uh, you know, are, are key success factors? How do you think we can make that very, very difficult change? Thank you for that. In fact, I, 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 perhaps I didn't take, do it technology properly. I, I put my hand up because I wanted to actually respond to Sadia's point and, and Rana's intervention. And I think it intersects with this. Um, Sadia actually touched on a very core issue and I prefaced um, my, my breathless introduction with this statement about patriarchal societies. Um, and I, it was on purpose that I said that I was from Pakistan originally and was raised in that household and understand very much so the, the, the cultural precepts that can go into it. I was very lucky. Uh, I had a very strong mother with very progressive views and instilled that in, in the children. So when you come back to it, you look at societies and whether it's in uh, the Middle East or in, in Latin America and other parts of the world, you know, I reflected on yesterday being World Literacy Day. Right, and so much of what we're talking about, what Rana's talking about, and others, is about education. Right, your education not only formal but informal, and education through various means, and it could be, um, as you said, social media. But you know, even even something as simple as village drama sort of events and things like that convey messages and and things like that. The storytelling that that Roshan had referred to. These are, these are actually powerful instruments, but not very well um, absorbed by large organizations. You can't do that. But I think what Rana did is he highlighted exactly what I was trying to get to earlier. Many countries have these small discrete funds, like the American Embassy, we have it, many of them do that you can access locally, that you can start to build on some of these things. I think at national levels, and I think here, I'm going to say Rana A as opposed to Rana A rather than just Rana B. So Rana A referred to, um, to the LGBTQ question, right? And this has, been, this has been a process of education, right? It's been, it's been mainstreamed and, and, and at sometimes with some resistance because of, of culture and, and the rest. But it's been a long-term process of building that in. But it's been very effectively done. And in the same way, I think we do need to find a way, I think education is key on a lot of the issues, obviously, and you know, access for girls to SMEs and, or sort of to STEM education, 
and, and business training and, and, the, and the rest of that. Um, so that, that's one part of it. And I, there, is, there is an open question there, and I think that Rana has sort of just touched it, and that is how can you mainstream gender and gender equality the same way that we're now mainstreaming um, LGBTQ throughout what we do, everywhere. And it's part of our policy, I mean, overtly, it's supporting that in many countries. So even in countries where it's culturally difficult to do so. So there's a way of doing it. It's just mean thinking of the policy frameworks in front of the input to that. The other point I think that was very interesting that um, some of the, the points that Rana A brought up with, again, in terms of the support for women's organizations. And again, I'm going to go to a, a previous job, and that was to the Inter-American Development Bank. But there, there was a program called Opportunities for the Majority, right? So this is where you were actually provided more than microfinancing. It was really to align, if you will, um, small and micro businesses with larger organizations. So it's not just providing money, it's providing the mentorship that comes with it, the, the business acumen that come with it, the products, and the, re, the sh reshaping and redefining the product offering. So, you know, you don't want to sell large bottles of, of shampoos in the markets of Lagos. For most of them, they just want to solve, that's what they can sell, that's what they can afford, and you need to talk to Johnson & Johnson about making product that small, and they do. So there are methods to go through it and some multilaterals do it and some don't. I think you have to look at it from a regional basis, but there is, there is this, this whole set of activities around opportunities for the majority, uh, at the bottom of the pyramid, you can call it what you want, but it affords, it affords access to goods and services and training and mentorship um, to exactly that, that, that audience that we need to, to move along. And I'll just close on another very interesting, um, and again, I don't want to be marketing for other uh, private organizations, but uh, years ago, Goldman Sachs did a wonderful program called 10,000 Women, where they would identify through um, local universities, um, young women entrepreneurs that were elected by their own community, their own peers. It wasn't like Goldman Sachs was going in there and picking them. And they were then, um, curated up the system. Now, of course, Goldman Sachs is cultivating its next clientele. We get it. But there's a lot of good in the middle, of, in the between all of that. So, you know, we recognize that this, this virtuous cycle that can exist between the public sector and the private sector is often much more nimble and much more effective. And if we can find a way of bridging that, and particularly on the education part of it, the, the, the changing of the norms and the rest of it, and it's education, as, as um, uh, Nihal was saying, it's actually, it's not my generation or my parents' generation. I'm actually worried about the next generation, right? And like I said before, I had just twin girls three months ago and I really want, they're the first of the next, this COVID generation. And I actually have no idea what world they're walking into, either in terms of society, what, what will be the challenges that they face as young women. Um, whether it's, and then there's the health part of it, and then there's security part of it. And I think, as I think Rana said, or maybe Roshan said it, we're looking at COVID today and gender equality today post pandemic or post COVID. But a lot of this was pre COVID. What it's done, what COVID is, is it just stripped away the veneer and pull out the very raw and harsh and ugly truths that have always existed, but just made them much more present. And there will be a time when, just like 9-11, we won't remember what travel was like before 9-11. We just know what travel was like after 9-11. And we have to sort of think about what does the future hold and what, are, what do we need to do as, as policymakers? When I say that, I don't mean it from government's perspective. Each one of us are agents in our own way. And is to, so, so how do we impact that in the best way we can and build the support networks that we need to, to drive those narratives forward? I can also just jump in here because I think there's some, um, 
some things in co um, that I picked up that maybe I might even just slightly disagree. And I think that panel, you know, panels can be more interesting when panelists uh, may not have the same opinion um, as well. Um, but I just wanted to just maybe have a slight note of caution on the comparison to uh, the LGBTQ uh, movement. Um, and I think that maybe it's just a different reading of it. But I think one of the, the reasons that that movement got more mainstream was actually it moved away from the more flamboyant kind of gay pride, you know, um, uh, events to actually something that was quite deeply conservative, right? Um, you know, the gay rights movement went towards, we want to get married, we want to serve in the military. Um, you know, these are somewhat conservative ideas and, and I think that's helped to make it more mainstream. Um, and I think also that you started to see that younger generations, you know, it just wasn't a topic, wasn't an issue for them, it was normal uh, for them. And, and, you know, like Nihal was saying, um, um, you know, I also pick up on that also because we are also, you know, training someone who works uh, at a head of the curve right now um, in our program. Um, but in India, it's similar to Egypt in that, you know, the, the, the human rights space is deeply constrained at the moment. Uh, and also the younger generations, both men and women, seem to have more regressive views on gender equality. Um, you know, women's participation in the workforce is declining in India voluntarily. Um, in many cases, there's lots of documentation on that. And so I just think that there's like, um, you know, I'm not sure the appeal to the conservative um, uh, is going to help the, the gender equality movement right now. Um, so that, that was just sort of one caution that I, I would just be, you know, have on that analogy. Um, uh, and I think just, you know, quickly on the narrative piece, you know, I think um, because the gender equality thing is something that's been with us for millennia, uh, perhaps, you know, certainly centuries, um, I think, you know, we, it's important to have the systemic solutions. But again, I think it's going to be more like drip, 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 you know, it's like one person at a time uh, changing their views, looking at these silos, whether it's the private sector, whether it's, we're working with, uh, you know, with sports in, in Brazil with, uh, you know, gender equality in football uh, in a program with the government over there. Um, it's kind of like, how do you change individual minds? Um, you know, and that's, that's at least how, you know, I think that could be one solution. Uh, long-term work, not, not short-term, but this problem has been with us for a long time uh, as well. And I'll say thank you, Roshan, for, for pointing that out. I was definitely not making the comparison to get us more conservative narrative. I would not be an advocate of that at all. <laughs> but I didn't think so. <laughs> I, thought I, 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 was, I was more so making kind of that, that whole kind of narrative change of how, how it can actually kind of influence uh, a general shift. And I, and I just wanted to say to Nihal as well to kind of, put, you know, kind of keep your spirits up, although I agree on the regression of, of views, especially among the young people. So we just launched actually in uh, MENA on June 4th, uh, our 10 episode YouTube satire um, show called Smatu Haminni, which is very hip, very cool, hosted by this young, um, you know, 22 year old Maria Alayan, who's an influencer. And, and she's, we basically wanted to tap into what, um, what you would consume, uh, anyone would consume in terms of content these days, specifically young people. Um, and we created this whole show. You can watch it, by the way, on uh, YouTube. It's, it's uh, subtitled in English. Um, it did phenomenally well. Uh, so we are, you know, we got, uh, you reached 25 million young people in MENA across different countries, 10 million um, actual video views, 2 million engagements. But what we have no, two things that I wanted to mention. Um, none of the mainstream uh, distributors that we approached, um, none of the mainstream media distributors that we approached wanted to take it on. Although the content, it, you know, they knew that the content would be hugely consumed, but the topics were too controversial um, in a sense that, you know, we were bold in talking about, uh, we had 10 episodes, we addressed uh, masculinity, we addressed periods, we addressed honor, we addressed, and it was, um, it was, it was, we employed satire. So it was funny. It was bold. It was uh, narrated by a young woman from the region. Um, and this was all done, you know, you know, written, produced, uh, presented by, young woman from the region, uh, from Beirut to, you know, Dubai to Palestine to Jordan. Uh, so we didn't find any kind of big, uh, big because, because to, to uh, you know, to Jamal's earlier point, um, there is uh, this um, unease of, of taking that up massively and at, at, at kind of a, at a, um, a more systemic level. Um, 
but we're, we're still doing it. And, and there were other distributors that we managed to find that would collaborate with us. It's, it's not only us. There were others that were as excited to kind of push this content. It's about producing more of that. And I think that is where we see the silver lining. I think another point that I wanted to mention is that what we originally thought about the views of young women in the region specifically, we were very surprised to actually learn that a lot of them are far ahead the curve of understanding and wanting their rights than we originally thought. Um, that was something that we were extremely happy about because we actually expected a lot more pushback from the women in the region because we know the surveys, we know the statistics, and we were expecting a lot more pushback. But actually, for this particular audience, this young millennial who is uh, kind of more inclined to watch this content online, they were far ahead the curve than what we had thought. Um, on the other side, what we have realized is that young men in the region are far behind. So what we are left with today after years of kind of pushing this uh, agenda in the region is that the women have moved along, but we left the men behind. We, we were not talking to the men about, um, you know, gender roles and, and gender power dynamics in a way that they would be inclined to, to listen to and, and to actually kind of connect with. Uh, and so in an essence, we've created a bigger gap almost. And now we have a bit of a problem on that front. Um, but of course, you know, that's not going to stop us. You know, our, our next thing could be how, how do we address and how do we promote positive masculinity in MENA? But again, to Ro Roshan's point, at the moment, this is very drip, drip, drip. This is very uh, not at a level at all where we'd be able to really, truly move mountains and shift kind of these, uh, you know, huge challenges, in my opinion, that are really sit at the core of this, this whole, uh, you know, topic of gender equality. And I'm sorry if I took too long. No, that's fine. I, uh, I just, uh, and thank you so much for all those comments. I just want to accumulate the last question, uh, but very, very quickly, please, in one minute. And it's, there, it's a question directed at Roshan. Um, so, uh, and I find it also interesting because it's, it's, it's a little bit different from the other ones. Uh, so I think we, we spoke a lot about norms and, and you know, trying to shift uh, cultural beliefs. Uh, this one is radically different. So Roshan, how do you, and it's from me, from LIMAC, LIMAC group in, in, in Turkey. So how do you see the future of impact investing in the upcoming period? Well, the economies are all talking, discussing about recovery stimulus packages, and how does that tie to the, to the subject of the day? Um, and you know, you, you are talking about all this uh, social entrepreneurship work that you're, you're conducting. So how can you relate the two uh, together? And please, in one or two minutes, thank you. <laughs> sure, I'll do my best. Um, I think the impact investing field, I'm, I'm not uh, actively in that field, but um, we watch it. Um, and I think there's a big recognition of the fact that um, women-led enterprises have a much harder time raising money uh, from investors um, than male-led enterprises. And so there have been recently kind of big proposals or tenders put out, one by the UK aid and one by USAID um, in partnership with Visa um, to get to help women-led enterprises be more um, financially ready for investment. Um, we applied to both of those, um, didn't get selected to either. Um, but I know that, um, but I know that this is a topic that you know the impact investment com uh, community is really trying to address to see how more money can be invested in enterprises led by by women. And I think that uh, that probably will be something that will grow. Um, in, the, in the years to come. So that's my one minute, Agnes. Thank you so much. Um, I'll just wrap up our conversation, mindful of time. Uh, thank you all again for participating and having such uh, engaging uh, uh, you know, conversations. Um, I would like to just sum up uh, what we've, uh, we've spoken about today. And you know, my uh, notes basically are about uh, how gender power, power dynamics are key in the game how uh, initiatives around social entrepreneurship and education are actually most prone to making this change uh, happen uh, and uh, how we all have i mean it's it's about proactiveness about leadership and how we all have a role to play like literally all of us at individual organization levels uh, we are the change and the agents of uh, the change um, on that, I hope that the, the United Nations can, can then, you know, um, find a role in the middle of this uh, need for change. Um, and I would like to end the, uh, the, the, the conversation today 
um, asking you. So I will ask you to um, to raise your hands. Uh, to uh, there was one question by the uh, by the UN to uh, to know what 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 people think about uh, the situation of women uh, in 2045. So when the UN turned 100 years old. Uh, so please use the functionality at the bottom of Zoom to raise hands or do whatever sign you can do. Uh, if you think that women would be better off than today, please raise your hand. If you think that women will be just equal or worse off than today, please raise your hand. Oh my God, either we're very pessimistic or only Rana is optimistic here. Oh no, we have a few. <laughs> A few people, but you know, it's very interesting to see that. Um, I guess most of us know it's coming. Okay, so it's coming. So I guess it's uh, more or less equal. <laughs> so we're all optimistic. Uh, some of us are optim optimistic, and um, but yeah, it could be better. <laughs> anyway, thank you so very much for our guest speakers for attending and enlightening our conversation, and all of you for taking part in it. Uh, last round will be, uh, will be for you to speak, uh, and thank you all. Uh, thank you so much, Agnes, for moderating such a fantastic uh, discussion, and to Jamal, Rana, and Rana. You don't know which Rana I'm referring to, and Roshan. But also everybody who participated. I know that there were some great uh, great participants, Melly and, and, and Summer, who weren't able to ask their uh, poignant questions and frame their comments. So we will have to do a round two, uh, just so you know, Lee Mack and she's Arab, great partners of ours doing great work out there. Um, I think this is the beginning of the discussion. I, I will leave you with two pieces of thought around Globesite's philosophy. One is push back against what becomes the consensus at UNGA about amazing initiatives. Most of them are all hype. We know that, we don't need to participate. We can push back when you have a collective voice. The second thing is, and with all respect to my country and Canada, the, the push around the framing of the issues, and you mentioned the LGBTQ issue, has to be rooted locally, and not just locally from organizations that are funded from the West, but organizations that are empowered and driven from within the global East and South, maybe partnering with those from the West. I think we need to have that to really change the power structures, whether it's on gender equality or any of the other issues we're talking about significant weight with regards to UN 75. So those are two pieces of Globesite philosophy. Um, we really uh, welcome you uh, here today, all of you. I didn't you mention Nasreen as well, also uh, you know, had, a, had a question. So we'll have to get that to some of the, some of the panelists uh, after. Thank you so much. Thank you again to Agnes and to everybody for, for this. And uh, we'll see you again soon. Thank you.